Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our sermon this morning is based mainly upon the Word of God found in our second lesson, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, as printed in your bulletin and already read. Dear people of hope, in theory, the people of our nation and our Facebook and Twitter feeds should get as upset at the death of 120-some Nigerians or Indians or Iraqis or Malaysians or Vietnamese or Chinese as they do with the death of 120-some Parisians. After all, it is just as many lives snuffed out, just as much innocence lost, just as much tragedy. But we feel it more because, let's be honest, we have more of a culture in common with the French, and, well, we kind of expect such things to happen in certain other parts of the world. It's, it's just not as newsworthy when some tragedy wipes entire villages off the map somewhere in remote Asia. And it doesn't feel as worthy of our outrage or sympathy when, when ISIS members in Syria or Iraq kill thousands of their own countrymen. Now, confronted with that reality, we usually feel guilty that we don't feel more feeling for the people who are less like us. But it still doesn't change our typical expectations. Bad things are supposed to happen to people we don't like or people we don't have much in common with. Since we defeated the Nazis, the Soviet Empire dissolved, and the gospel of Western democracy has, has spread across Europe and much of the globe. Bad things, or at least bad things that are done by bad people, well, those are just not supposed to happen in civilized places to civilized people. You, you know, those who share our Christianized culture and values. Not supposed to happen. Says who? A study of both history and psychology will certainly suggest that man's capacity for evil and propensity for violence have not changed and that likely never will. While it is true that nations are much less likely to go to war now than they were hundreds of years ago, it is also true that technology has made our weapons many times more deadly and the destruction they can wreak that much more extensive. It simply costs more to go to war. But as Christians, we do not need to make sociological judgments about the improvability of humanity. We know that all people are sinners and are therefore capable of unimaginable evil. We know that all people, being sinners, must therefore die. And we know that this world, rather than, than gradually growing toward perfection, is instead heading for evil so great that God will eventually cry out, Enough! and bring it all to an end. We call that day Judgment Day. And though we will not know when it will arrive, it will not be unprecedented or unexpected. As the world grows more evil, the last day grows more close and more likely. But of course, in the meantime, there still is tragedy. 
There are the highly public horrors like what happened Friday in France. And there are the everyday below the radar losses that we all experience when, when people dear to us die, whether from violence, disease, or simple old age. And because of these, we grieve. If not yesterday, then today. If not today, then tomorrow. We grieve. The only way to avoid it is to give up caring about others. And for Christians who seek to love as Christ loves them, that, that is not an option. The only question then is this. How will we handle grief when it comes and the end as we await its coming? The Holy Spirit moved Paul to write 1 Thessalonians largely to answer that question, or rather to help us answer it for ourselves. He wants us to understand that neither death nor the destruction of the world mean the same thing to us as believers as they do and will for unbelievers. And he wants us to both be encouraged by this and to encourage others. So let's review the, the truths that Scripture places before us today. We start with a, a truth that is actually not included in our reading from 1 Thessalonians 4, but, but is in both of our readings from Daniel and Mark. Christ will come back for the second and final time after a period of great distress. What exactly that will look like, we do not know. And how different that will be from what we are experiencing right now, Scripture does not say. In every age, Christians ask, how much more evil could this world possibly get? Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. But so far the Lord has waited. And since it will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then, and the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Since that was the, that's what that distress will be like, we can be certain that both the build up to the end and the end itself will bring great tragedy and grief. And then Christ will come. And for his people, this will be the most welcome and glorious and joyous of days. Because for all who belong to him by faith, it will mean the eternal end of tragedy and grief and mourning and pain and trouble and tears and anger, frustration, despair, depression, fear, misgiving, stress, and strain. Because he is coming to take us home with him, to rescue us from the destruction of the world, and to give us, finally and fully, all the blessings of eternal life in paradise. Instead of being the church militant in constant conflict with the evil of this world, we will be saints triumphant, at peace forever in heaven. What will happen on that day? Last week we discussed more of the details of the judgment. So today, just as the same way that the saints in paradise will be eternally untroubled by loss or grief or tragedy, so today we get to skip over the, the tragic side of it, the damnation that awaits those who have rejected God's salvation in Christ through unbelief. But Paul tells us that on the last day, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Since the earth and the heavens as we know them will be destroyed by fire when the judgment is complete, it is a good thing that we will be caught up with Christ when he comes with the clouds. 
but first he will raise the dead and bring the departed faithful to him that we might all be joined together in his triumph. And this, this gives the great reason why we as Christians will never grieve death in the same way that others do. We have hope. And that's not just wishful thinking, the, the thought of, <clears throat> thought of a, a better life that someone holds on to just because it's, it's too upsetting to consider anything else. No, we have the sure and certain promise of life with Christ after death and the resurrection to paradise at his coming. We only call it hope because it hasn't happened yet. But it is real, and it is ours right now and forever by faith in Jesus. And why? Why does that faith make all the difference? Because when we say that we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we are not just asserting or, or assenting to some historical events. We are confessing our confidence in the works and mercy of a gracious and loving God who, who loved us so much that he gave his one and only son to save us from our sins. Because we all needed saving. If terrorism and tragedy show us anything, they, they should drive home for us the reality that evil is ingrained in all people and that we are all hardwired for sin. Of course, we won't all set off bombs and shoot up theaters, mostly because we are more interested in self-preservation than in making statements. But we all have it in us to insist that our way be the only way and, and to lash out when others disagree and insist on their way. Instead, we, we see it in the tantrums of toddlers and the taunts of trolls on the internet. And we see sin in ourselves any time we, we take a good look in the mirror of God's law. He tells us not to give his glory to any other, and yet we serve the gods of self, sex, and success. He tells us to honor all those who he has placed above us as his representatives, yet we disobey our parents, ignore instructions we disagree with, and insult anyone in government that we didn't vote for. He tells us not to steal, and yet we take our employer's pay for work we do not do, and we enjoy what others have pirated. God tells us not to give false testimony, yet we prefer lies and gossip to honesty and compassion. We are indeed, by nature and in every way, sinners who sin. And so we desperately needed a Savior. And Jesus was and is exactly the Savior we needed. The Father sent him. God made man. And his suffering and death on the cross counted as our suffering and death. What we deserve for our sins. So that our accounts have been wiped clean and all our sins forgiven. He transfers his righteousness to us, and now he presents us to his Father as pure and holy, fit for heaven, for heaven, for his sake. We believe this. Oh, how happy we are to believe this. And so just as we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we know that though we die, we will rise again to be with him. And that if he comes before we die, all those who have died believing in him will rise again to be with him and with us for good in paradise and its bliss forever. Can you think of anything more encouraging than that? 
What are death and distress in comparison to the truth of our resurrection to eternal life? What can tragedy or terrorists do to us that will not be undone by the Lord when he returns with the clouds? What sin or sadness or pain or problem or grief or groaning or shame or shadow can survive our translation from death to eternal life, from darkness to undying light? The end of all trials, all trouble, all tragedy, all terror is coming soon. Can there be any greater good news for us as Christians as we deal with the sorrows and stresses of this world? So rejoice, brothers and sisters. Take heart, baptized children of the Heavenly Father. Be excited, elect of the Lord. Christ is coming for all believers. He is coming for you to take you to live in his Jerusalem the golden with milk and honey blessed and to shine and to share in his glory. Wake, awake for night is flying. The watchmen on the heights are crying. Awake, arise Jerusalem, arise. Encourage each other with these words. He is coming soon. Hallelujah. Amen. Please rise.